Hey everyone, uh, this is Greg from Ashray, New York. Uh, we'll start the uh, broadcast in a few minutes. Just hold tight. All right. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, we are going to start the presentation now. Um, we'll catch the stragglers, stragglers from the line. Um, Greg, if you could go to the next slide. So uh, for everyone who wants PDH credit for this uh, presentation, please scan the QR code and it will bring you to a form in which you can fill out in order to uh, get it emailed to you after the presentation. Um, generally, we email them out one to two days after. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, starting with our tier one uh, carrier, Con Edison, WSP, and CDE. SRS, and our tier two sponsors are Train and the Fulcrum Group, JB&B and Johnson Controls, AKF and Siska Hennessy, Fleet, Polimo, and Goldman Copeland, ADS, Chimney Design Solutions and Federal Fund, Mitsubishi Electric, National Air Filter, and Batala. Cerami, Wallace Ennis, and Siemens. Thermal System Associates, Wraith, and Eco Care Corp. 
IMI, Walls Darby, especially, mm -hmm. and MPM boilers. Um, so as we previously mentioned, um, ASHRAE is hosting a mentorship program um, in which we are matching mentees with mentors, and you can find the information for this on our website. Um, it's on the main page. Next slide. Uh, so in January on the 20th, we will be holding a designer series on the next transition has begun a refrigerant update. Um, it is PDH approved and you can find the information for this under our events um, on the Asherite website. We will also be holding Psyched for Psychometrics on February 24th. This is another designer series, um, PDH approved, and um, the information for this is in the same location on the Azure website under events. So we have a few announcements about the gala, and um, I wanted to let everyone know that the tickets and sponsors are now on sale. So go over and get your tickets. Um, and if you'd like to be a sponsor, you can also sign up on our website. Um, and through January, the tickets will be discounted. So you're gonna wanna pick those up. Okay. So I'm gonna pass it over to our current president, Benjamin Rush. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. and wanted to welcome everyone to uh, the first meeting of 2022. We're really excited to kick off uh, the second half of our 2021-2022 ASHRAE year. Uh, we have a ton of good programming come up, coming up this spring. Uh, Mike went through a bit of it. Um, I know you, you saw that our January meeting got switched to um, February, so it's actually going to be on February 15th, so we'll update this flyer. Uh, it's still going to feature Emily Hoffman and Gina Bokra um, uh, representing New York City, talking about uh, the energy code here in New York versus New York State, along with updates on Local Law 97, updates on the new administration, uh, and answering some of your questions. So that one will be in person, so we're excited for that. Um, next slide. Uh, we have an event coming up that we're excited about to continue our partnership with the Building Energy Exchange. So we're going to be co-hosting an event um, with NYSERDA uh, talking about the Real-Time Energy Management Plus Tenant Program, uh, which will be you can sign up for on the Building Energy Exchange's website. Uh, so this should be a, a really good program that our Sustainability Committee put together. It's free. Uh, there will be PDH available. Uh, so this program might be interesting for you if um, if you're working with tenants and they're trying to understand how to do um, energy management. Uh, next. Uh, the two other things that we want to talk about, Greg, I don't know if we can pull up uh, the membership battle information on the website. And by the way, if you haven't been to uh, our website, we actually just finished uh, a brand new update with Star Chapters. So you're going to see a completely new look to the Asher New York website, um, to the homepage. So make sure to check that out. It's it's uh, got some new features and a and a better look than we've had in the past. So we're really excited about that. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, so some some new features, some new way that we're showing stuff. So if you have any feedback, please let us know. Um, and then so we're, we're excited to host what we're calling the membership battle. So society has been working to build back up the membership for ASHRAE uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And so before the pandemic, we had about 56,000 members globally. Uh, since then it has dropped uh, somewhat linearly to around 50,000 members and is just starting to turn the corner. Uh, but our region, Region 1, has pushed, um, has been working with us and, and we've been working with our other chapters to come up with creative ways to help build build the membership back up uh, and with not just events. So we're hosting what we're calling the membership battle. And this is going to be amongst all uh, qualifying firms here in New York. 
Uh, so there's two competitions. One is whoever, whichever firm can um, add the most gross members uh, between now and April 15th uh, is going to receive five free tickets to our gala on May 20th. Uh, and then also the firm that increases their membership by the highest percentage will receive five free tickets to uh, the gala on May 20th. So uh, we're trying to we're going to update you guys with some of the standings as we go throughout the next couple months. Uh, so make sure to spread the word uh, and the information to uh, to your acquaintances and to others within your firms and and your leadership. So we just wanted to thank uh, everyone here for being members of Ashray for uh, coming out to events and really look really hope some of, uh, some of you here can uh, uh, sponsor and attend the gala this year. Everybody remembers what a great event that is. So. Uh, thanks for attending, and I'll hand it back to Mike. Oh, and Mike, for the PDH, I think they'll get a link after the presentation. Is that right? Or survey? That is true. You will receive a feedback survey at the end of, it'll actually be an hour after the meeting ends, and it will have a link to the, where the QR code brings you for the PDH. There'll be another link for feedback on the presenter and the presentation and then a third link to our YouTube page, which we'll post, we will upload the, this meeting um, to about a week out from the end of this. So if you miss the QR code, it's okay. There'll be a link that's, <laughs> yeah. all right, thank you. All right, can I keep go back to bio? All right, and without further ado, I would like to introduce John Knowles. Uh, he's a senior vice president, uh, senior vice president of application engineer design for Walls Darby, which is a sponsor of Asher in New York. A uh, graduate of Union College with a BS in mechanical engineering, John holds a Leeds AP certification. His expertise is derived from years of hands-on applications and continuing education in the forms and functions of the equipment and the systems that make up his design designs. He began uh, in education many years providing to the engineering community in both and in both group and individual settings. John is proficient in system design, or sorry, system sizing and design software, as well as CAD programs. He believes in creating and maintaining a strong working relationship with the engineering community. John has worked for Walls Darby for over 30 years. I'd like to introduce John Knowles. Well, thank you, thank you. Appreciate uh, <clears throat> appreciate the chance to uh, to talk to everybody. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, good to be out and about. I wish we could do this uh, in person, but uh, <clears throat> hey, it is what it is. And uh, soon enough, soon enough, we'll all get together. So let me get this uh, presentation up. <clears throat> That's always the hard part. Okay. Does uh, everyone see the the, uh, the the welcome screen? Yep, you're good. Okay, great. All right. Again, thank you for having us. Certainly appreciate it. Uh, nice way to kick off the year. <clears throat> and uh, and with that, we'll we'll get going. Uh, again, I'm uh, John Knowles, senior vice president here at Wales Darby. Uh, who was Wales Darby? And uh, you know, where am I speaking from? So, do that quickly. <clears throat> Wales Darby's uh, coming up on 50 years old. Uh, roughly 75 uh, employees. We have three offices, uh, one here on Long Island in, uh, in Islandia, real small little town right off the expressway. That's where I am right now. We have a Jersey office as well and uh, opened a, a Philadelphia office uh, three years ago. We are representative. We represent many different manufacturers. We believe they're all uh, excellent in their field. Um, we represent companies that make condensing boilers. We represent companies that make pumps, automatic flow balancing valves. <clears throat> we get outside the mechanical room into the space, HRVs and ERV units, right? The V and HVAC, suddenly much more important than ever before. <clears throat> we are also uh, representative of uh, a couple of different terminal unit manufacturers, right? We represent a company that makes chilled beams, which may be the next big thing. We are the, uh, we represent a company that makes radiant systems, low temperature convectors and fan coils. Um, we have an air to air heat pump 
may be the answer to a lot of the electrification uh, <clears throat> issues here in New York. We are in the VRF business as well. We are also on the plumbing side. We represent two manufacturers of water heaters. We are, manu <clears throat> we are our manufacturers rep for water treatment systems, and we represent companies that make water pressure boosters and sump and sewage <clears throat> systems. Tonight, we'll be talking about automatic flow balancing valves, <clears throat> a product whose time has probably come. So we'll discuss that as we go along in our hour together. We are the Griswold representative. Uh, we'll be talking about this product, <clears throat> uh, but uh, what it does and uh, <clears throat> uh, what's on the inside of it. But we'll be talking mostly about how it affects uh, the things that are in the, in, the, uh, in the space where people are. Uh, certainly chilled beams, um, <clears throat> low temperature convection, radiant systems, and how it affects variable speed pumping. Hey, John, a quick item is Greg. Uh, you, you can turn on your camera if you'd like. That's oh, sure. Good. There you go. Okay. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, that's all you. That's all you. Just like, yeah, keep going. I just wanted to just mention that. Yeah. Right, go back there now. Let's see if I get back. There we go. Okay. So, again, this is um, automatic flow balancing valves. Uh, this is a decredited presentation. So, um, but uh, so please, uh, you know, sign in or, or scan and uh, so we can get your, your points. Um, aren't too many words in this presentation regarding automatic flow balancing valves. Uh, a lot of pictures, graphs, and the like. So, uh, Please, if you would, uh, any questions, uh, <clears throat> Greg, you can give me the heads up. I'll try to answer them as best I can. Sorry, John, I was saying you could leave your camera on if you'd like, just uh, you know, while you're presenting as well, so that everybody can see it. Okay, it kind of takes over the whole screen there. Um, and would everyone just else want... will see? Well, they'll see the presentation just fine, and you're just like minimized on top. Just uh, for you, it would be a little different. But does it does it block block you? Yeah, it blocks the whole prezo. Okay, then you can uh, turn yours off then. Sorry. Um, okay, let's, so uh, let's get let's begin. And uh, again, uh, again, any questions? Please uh, feel free to ask them. We'll again, we'll uh, we'll take a shot at it. So we're going to talk just, about during our hour together. Hey John, uh, can I make an announcement? Sure. I just want to let everyone know there's a chat function in the side where you can um, throughout the presentation give John questions so please feel free to fill that out at any time you do not need to wait till the end okay so uh, <clears throat> first thing we'll talk about is a uh, manual balance valves versus automatic flow balancing valves um, New York City has uh, uh, been a market for manual balance valves for a very very long time um, <clears throat> specified more often than not so we'll talk about that product briefly and, uh, and compare it to an automatic flow balancing valve. We'll talk about applications. Where are we gonna use this product um, <clears throat> successfully? How do these things work? What's on the inside of them that, uh, that make them do their thing? We'll do a bit of cost comparisons because that is the big deal here in New York. Maybe not so much anymore. Uh, it just becomes a more of a return on investment uh, industry compared to an initial cost industry. What do we have to know about these automatic flow balancing valves to uh, apply them successfully? And if you think it's a good idea to use this product, how do we specify it? And lastly, we'll talk about the PIC valve, the pressure independent control valve. Uh, that's just a, a short list of what we'll talk about. If you want to talk about anything else, please let us know. We'll be again, we'll take a we'll take a good hard shot at it. Okay, let's start off with an installation manual, part of an installation manual from a chilled beam manufacturer. Accurate commissioning is more important. That is correct. This is where we are. Accurate commissioning is more important than ever. So this is a strange system we'll get into a little bit more, the chilled beam system. Real low flows, around one GPM, perhaps up to two and a half GPM, very low flow. And this manufacturer of chilled beam gives us a choice. We can use a balancing valve circuit setter or an automatic flow control valve, automatic flow balancing valve, if you will. And there it is on the return of our automatic, our, our, our active chilled beam. I think it's backwards. I think that isolation valve should be downstream, but um, 
it gives us a choice. So which one shall we uh, employ to make this this uh, this system work perfectly? The uh, balancing, the manual balancing valve or an automatic flow control valve. So let's talk about these two choices. What's the difference between the two? Circus set is an automatic flow balancing valves. Manual balancing valves have a fixed orifice. Manually set, it's called a manual balance valve. You have to touch it in order to create artificial relative resistance. Automatic flow balancing valves have a variable orifice. Automatically, just like it says, you don't have to touch it in the field to create or relieve resistance and allows up to a factory set maximum flow. That maximum flow is your design day flow through that terminal unit and it's factory set. That's why automatic flow balancing valves are also called flow limiters. So I'll use that term uh, interchangeably uh, with automatic flow balancing valves. They're the same thing, flow limiters, automatic flow balancing valves. Let's take a look at uh, some of the manual balance valves that uh, enjoy a fair amount of market share here in New York City. <clears throat> they all seem to have a red thing you have to touch, handles, knobs, dials. Uh, this is a fixed orifice. We set the uh, opening of the orifice, which this red uh, handle, red knob, red disc. We all have to touch it to make it work as we expect it to. This is the cross section of an automatic flow balancing valve. It has a variable orifice. Here's our path of water through this device. This is the device we'll talk about next. This is, uh, we call it a couple of different names, cartridge, uh, piston, can. Uh, it is a variable orifice. This is a spring, cross-section of a spring, and that pushes this pie-shaped orifice out into the water stream, uh, depending on certain conditions, and that is a variable orifice. This handle right here is not red. It is a true isolation valve. In this case, it's a ball valve. This is not used for uh, adjusting flow. Uh, this device right here, again, is the only thing that makes uh, or limits flow in this device. So again, New York City is a very large market for manual balance valves. Why would I consider changing my spec that's been in place for a very long time to uh, use automatic flow balancing valves? Well, things are always changing, right? This is a different game than it was 10 years ago even, right? This is the energy efficiency business. When the, <clears throat> we're trying to save energy whenever we can. We are thankfully more involved in that than ever before. So we're gonna design systems utilizing higher Delta Ts, right? Basic <clears throat> uh, equation, equating load to flow uh, B2 is an hour equals delta T times 500. That's a constant times flow. Load is load, right? We're in the comfort business as well. We're not going to change that. Um, but we can change delta T, and that directly affects flow. Higher the delta T, flow goes down. And if we do that, <clears throat> our pumps get smaller. Therefore, their motors get smaller. And maybe we can decrease the uh, size of the pipe involved. And this is all very... <clears throat> Uh, this is good stuff, except nothing is free. We know this. Terminal units with higher delta Ts have less tolerance for unbalanced flow conditions. Now we have to really dial in the flow to make these high performance system systems perform as we uh, <clears throat> as we design them to do. So applications we want to be involved in going forward, knowing what we know. Hydronic systems, hot water, 180 to 160, 20 degree delta T. All right, long time ago, many decades ago, right, the boiler guys out there, right, the cast iron guys and the <clears throat> and the water tube guys decided that 20 degrees delta T across their boiler would uh, allow it to last a good long time. Anything higher, crack sections, pull tubes. 180 to 160. Right? That's the uh, 
that's the the fin tube guys the fin tube guys said i can get this much surface area against this piece of pipe <clears throat> that's all i can do and i'm going to put this temperature through it 180 to make air become buoyant across it and create a convective cell now is our playground <clears throat> in a heating system for a really long time chilled water 45 to 54 10 degree delta c system that's staying the same Although 10 degrees will probably move a little bit higher to that, 45 to 56, 12 degrees, all in the order of decreasing pumping power and maybe making a smaller pipe size if we can on that system. So hot water and chilled water. But all these fabulous systems out there have different temperatures. So most of our applications now are going to be for warm water, which probably, probably, is a 150 to 120 system, 30 degree delta T, very nice. <clears throat> nice uh, reduction of, uh, of pumping power and 150 to 120, that 120 is a great number, especially if we're using a condensing boiler, right? That makes those boilers condense nicely. But we have to, even that's not uh, the same, right? Maybe we have to go 140 to 110 stay at 30 degree delta T, right? We don't know what's going to happen with our, our gas condensing boilers. I may know they're changing everything from gas to something else. Air to water heat pumps are the likely choice, and that's only going to go up to 140. So that may be our new water temperature system we have to use. And then there's cool water, right? Sensible only cooling. And that temperature is going to be 58 to 63, a five degree delta T system. Yeah, we just spoke about increasing delta T, but not this one. This one's going to decrease delta T uh, and go from 58 to 63. Staying below the dew point, but trying to cool off that space we're in. So those are our applications. Probably not going to get into hot water uh, on a new design anytime soon. Chilled water, warm water, cool water is where we're going to dwell. So this is a chart, kind of a different chart, but it's a, it's relevant. <clears throat> design flow versus design delta T. So we've got design delta T at the bottom here, design flow on the left-hand side, and different supply water temperatures for cooling systems and heating systems. For 90% of heat transfer, we'll talk about that. So design flow versus design delta T for 90% of heat transfer. So where do we find this, this crazy chart? Well, it's in there. It's in the uh, <clears throat> it's in the ASHRAE handbook, <clears throat> testing and balancing. So let's take a look at our, our what this, this chart tells us. So our, our, our heating system temperatures that we've used for many decades, the 180 to 160, 20 degree delta T. So there's our 20 degree delta T. And if we go up to 180, what design flow do we need to get 90% of the heat transfer out of that terminal unit? 50%. So if we needed 10 GPM, that's my design day flow to get the <clears throat> BTUs per hour out of that heating coil. If I only send five to it, 90% of the time it, it works well very tolerant system and that is why there's a whole bunch of people saying out there mostly contractors who say this is a self-balancing system because it's so tolerant you can be off by half and still get 90 percent out of it and there's probably some fudge in there <clears throat> so your design day if you get there at all right two percent of the time um so rarely does it come into play and that is why Many contractors say it's self-balancing, as if, as if your heating system had a self. So nothing is self-balancing. It's just very tolerant. And the 180 to 160 uh, system is extremely tolerant. Let's take a look at a chilled water system. That was a 10 degree delta T system, uh, 45 degree supply. All right, just a little bit, a little bit more uh, less tolerant of a lack of flow. 
So we need uh, <clears throat> to get 90% out of that that uh, that coil. We need seven GPM if I needed 10 on design day. Let's take a look at another system. There's our 30 degree delta T system with 150. That is a very difficult system to balance. Much more difficult than the 180 to 160 system. We take a, a little bit uh, further look if I had an air to water heat pump system and had to only supply 140 with a 30 degree delta T. Now it's really close to the, uh, to the, the lack of tolerance of a chilled water system. What about a 12 degree chilled water system? Even more less tolerant, even less tolerant of a, of a lack of flow, if you will. And what is the most difficult system there is to balance? All right. This kind of trend here is the higher the delta T, the more difficult it is to balance. Not this system, though. <clears throat> the sensible cooling system, five degrees at 58, is the most difficult uh, hydronic system there is to balance. The sensible only cooling system takes the cake. That system is probably going to be in play a lot moving forward with what we know now and the need for uh, ventilation and, uh, and be able to. Uh, work with uh, cool water and warm water. So a lot of bad stories out there regarding sensible cooling, even some condensing boiler problems that we're aware of. So a quick question, what happens if the flow to the chilled beam is insufficient, right? Chilled beam, sensible only cooling. What have we seen happen out there? Well, the zone in which that chilled beam <clears throat> or, or a number of chilled beams, it doesn't cool, doesn't perform. How is this fixed? Well, usually instead of balancing the entire system, <clears throat> the fix, the quick fix that uh, is thought to be the solution is to what? Here's the issue, it's 58 degrees, it should be cooler and that temperature is turned down. And our fabulous sensible only cooling system turns into a latent load removal system. And things, uh, things go, go badly. So chill beams is an emerging system, <clears throat> fabulous system, comfortable system, healthy system, but without the right balancing can go very badly because it already has, right? What's wrong with this picture? This is a picture from an uh, installation manual from a uh, number of years ago, right? Here's our ch active chill beam. <clears throat> Here's our primary air coming in from our DOAS unit. And we have to induce, it's right, there's an induction unit. We have to induce air up across, the, across this coil and out the sides. Well, what's blocking the, <clears throat> the movement of air up? Well, this condensate pan and it's supposed to be sensible only. This is the kind of stuff that happens without balancing. What's right with this picture? I hope everyone recognizes this place. <clears throat> this is the Moynihan train station. This is a, uh, this is a, a passive chill beam system. It's an upside down passive chill beam. This is a radiantly cooled floor. This is August. I went there just to make sure, right? And there was no uh, sheen of water on it. So this is the manifold or <clears throat> one of the manifolds serving this floor. And there is our automatic flow balancing valve. And the tubing that's serving this floor, there's a manual valve. So we can put uh, manual valves in series with automatic flow balancing valves. But this would be a very difficult system to make work perfectly without 
uh, excellent balancing. Good. Okay. These are the guys that are used to installing 180 to 160. I don't need those valves. They're too expensive. <clears throat> You're gold plating the job. These guys who have been involved in sensible cooling only get it entirely. So let's talk about what's on the inside of this thing. What makes it different than a, a manual balance valve that you have to touch uh, the red handle knob or disc? So this is our cross section from before. There's that uh, piston or can or cartridge with its variable orifice. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Most of them are stainless steel. There's a number of manufacturers. Uh, some are stamped stainless steel. Some are machine stainless steel. Uh, but there's our spring that is also stainless steel. It has to last a good long time in that water. <clears throat> so different uh, grades of stainless steel. So there are two different shapes, two different cuts from the factory that stick out into the water stream, um, a parabolic shape and a circular shape. And between these two openings, <clears throat> as it goes in and out of this cartridge, of course, this is the variable uh, part. Um, if it were to bottom out, if you will, the circular openings still remain in the water stream, uh, providing a path for water to flow through the device. Uh, we do not want to deadhead any pumps. And uh, that is, a, <clears throat> right, this is a cap. So if you wanted to take it out, you certainly could and put it back in. Um, there's another reason for that. We'll talk about that next. So that's what's on the inside of an automatic flow balancing valve. Most of the manufacturers are made of stainless steel. There is a, uh, There are some folks making it out of plastic as well. So how does this thing do its, uh, do its job? How does a flow limiter work? So we did, a, you know, we did our calculation. We have our design day flow through our terminal unit. That is our <clears throat> maximum design day flow right across this, this orange line here. And the flow <clears throat> across this device will increase as differential pressure increases across it. So the more pressure across that, the more what's going to happen across that that flow limiter's uh, cartridge. It's gonna look kind of look like that. That's kind of the profile of what it looks like. So in this gray area, we have this flow here and there's something going on there. With the, the, it's below the desired flow rate. So the automatic flow balancing valve isn't doing anything. It's fully out. It is a fixed orifice, if you will. It's sitting out there in the water stream. It only comes into play when you try to over pump it, flow limiter, try to put more flow through it than it was designed for. And then it starts to do its modulation, moving in and out of the can uh, with a variable orifice, providing a variable orifice. If, if it gets to the point where the differential pressure across this device gets to increases, it'll bottom out. Those circular openings are still exposed to the flow. So again, we're a fixed orifice, but flow will go through it. So this green area, if you will, is where we're going to, uh, where the flow limiter does its work. And that is a PSI control range, pressure, uh, pressure, lowest pressure, highest pressure, and where it can modulate. Before it's not doing anything, something's doing, something has authority here, probably the control valve, if, if it's a modulating uh, application. and if it does bottom out, and it shouldn't, but if it did, it becomes a, a fixed orifice as well. So let's talk about this control range. <clears throat> this is a, a chart from a manufacturer of a of a automatic flow balancing valves. Here, are the GPM uh, that can be cut from the factory, right? The lowest one is 0 0.25, 0 0.33. So. If anyone's had to try to balance one GPM through a through a three quarter inch pipe, this is a lot easier. Just get it cut for one GPM. 
So 0.25, again, this is three half inch up to two inch there and <clears throat> get it cut for up to 114. Now it may not get exactly, if you had 2.75, we'd get it cut for three. The range between the minimum and maximum pressure differential is, is, the, is where the flow limiter can maintain the desired flow or limit the flow. So the closer to the pump, usually the higher the range. So let's talk about that briefly. This is our PSID range, two to 32. <clears throat> That's two to 32 PSI. I would say 95% of all flow limiters uh, leave the factory with this range in it. Uh, 32 PSI being roughly 75 feet. So if you have a pump that's um, 250 GPM at 75 feet, all those flow limiters in that system are gonna get cut for whatever GPM you need, but the pressure range is gonna be two to 32. If you have a pump set that's 100, well, maybe the flow limiters closest to that pump, maybe two floors, three floors uh, up or down, depending where your pump is, maybe we get it in a, a 4 to 57 PSID range. And please note that the head loss in feet is 7.4. That's what we plug in in your head calc for your pump. The rest of the you know, uh, if it's 10 stories, maybe two stories are, uh, if it is a 100 foot pump, uh, TDH pump, four to 57 on the first two stories, and the rest are two to 32. Okay. So thank you for your attention so far without asking any uh, questions regarding cost. So let's go through that. Manual balancing valve dollars versus flow limiter dollars. Our contractor price for a three quarter inch manual balancing valve with a memory stop, roughly 35 bucks. Cost of balance, if you do it right, right, you really have to touch it a couple of times, three times um, in most uh, manual balancing valve manufacturers uh, uh, installation manuals, got to touch it three times, all of them. 150 bucks an hour, 20 minutes. <clears throat> Uh, you know, seven minutes a touch, $50. Flow accuracy, some are better than others, but for argument's sake, plus or minus 10%. We'll compare that to a contractor price for a three quarter inch flow limiter with an isolation valve, the same device we showed earlier. That was a ball valve, 65 bucks. Now you don't have to touch this thing. You can verify it if you want to. And let's say that's one touch, so it's a seven minute uh, uh, ordeal, again, the same labor allowance, so that's $18. And they're very accurate, plus or minus 5%. And the big deal in New York City for many, many decades is this, the initial cost difference. 35 versus 65, and usually that spells, we're not using these, they're too expensive. So, Let's talk about that now. <clears throat> and that is why manual balance valves uh, run the show in New York City. But it may be time to consider some other things because your new systems, all these new systems, are going to be much more flow sensitive than the previous systems we've designed. So let's talk about this because this is a big deal. It's hard to get over with this <clears throat> times the quantity at the bottom of the page in front of somebody. So let's talk about the entire system and what a what it looks like and then make a decision on whether or not it's worth doing or not at the very least we can explain the pricing so <clears throat> let's talk about that so same system right same number of terminal units and what happens if we use manual balancing valves on all these terminal units or we use automatic flow balancing valves so here are our terminal units and in this system how manual balancing valves work is if this is a three GPM terminal unit, design day GPM, design day flow is three, right? We have to touch this red one right here. We have to make nine go down this run out. And then we have to touch this one to make three go there and three go there and three go there. 
Same thing for here. You have to make a certain amount of GPM go through here and there on, the, on this <clears throat> on this branch. So we have to finish the risers, then the runouts, and each individual terminal unit. So to make, do this right on this type of system, we need 27 valves. If you use automatic flow balancing valves, this is cut from the factory for three. We don't have to make nine go here first. This is going to push back. It's got a spring in it. So three, three, and three. Don't have to put one on the run out, nor the riser, nor the trunk split. So there's only 18 valves in, this, in an automatic flow balancing valve system. And that's a big deal, because if we take a look at system versus system, the advantage price-wise changes dramatically. We have to do it right, though. Those valves have to go in there, and you have to so you know you have to offer access to them and the like. So let's take a look. There should be access at the terminal unit. Usually have a, um, a cabinet of some sort uh, right next to the uh, in the in the terminal unit or right next to it. So let's take a look at pricing now on that. So cost comparison, looking at a system, not just the unit to unit. So 27 manual valves, right? We said those three quarter valves were $35. But we have to add six inch and a quarters for the runouts. Then we had two rises at two inch. Then we have a trunk split, three inch valve, one. And if we add those together, <clears throat> we're at $1,861. Compared to that to 18 automatic flow balancing valves, there's our 56. Again, that 56 versus 35 is just difficult to overcome. But if we compare system to system, it's only $1,000. So if we can explain this automatic flow balancing valves are not more expensive than a well-designed manual valve system. It's 54 connections, and really to do it right, you have to touch each manual valve three times. Compared to 36 connections, and it's really one verification touch. It's automatic. You don't have to adjust it. Any questions on that? That kind of gets lost in the sauce on a lot of uh, projects. Hey John, uh, Greg here. I have a question um, for if you go back to your, uh, you know, your, your flow diagram or flow riser diagram. Um, maybe I missed this, but why why does the why do the manual valve uh, installation require that uh, nine GPM um, valve? That's uh, the versus yes, versus the automatic installation. One by one. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, that's how it's uh, that's that's a fixed orifice, relative resistance. All right, so that's I, I got to make twenty-seven go here first, then nine there and nine there. That's how manual valve manual balance valves work. Gotcha. Understood. Understood. Thanks. Yes, we have to. This is this is a dynamic device. This is not right. All that water would rather go here, right? That's the path of least resistance. There's nothing to push back against it. So this would have to be slightly more closed than this, than that, to make nine go there, nine go there, and nine go there. And that nine would rather go through this first unit, but you can't. You got to you got to close this down. Make sure only three goes there. And I got six here. And you have to make sure three and three go there. That's how. Uh, that's the that's the balancing process with a manual balance valve. So in that instance, you can't just set those blue manual balancing valves to three and just leave it at that and not have any other red uh, no, uh, valves, right? They'll go through here. All right. So no, that's uh, <clears throat> that is the uh, that is the true way of designing a manual balancing valve system. Good. 
Yes, yes, thank you again. We'll go through that then. So <clears throat> how many balancing how many balancing valves in your in your pump calc? So if our pumps uh, <clears throat> upstream of this of uh, uh, of this system, right? One, two, three, four. Four manuals in your if that's your index circuit, right? That's your last terminal unit uh, furthest from the pump. You have at least four manual valves in your in your in your pump TDH calc, right? Because we put these in series. Automatic flow balancing valves, we'll talk about it later, but we do not put them in series. They're all in parallel. So it's only one pressure drop you plug into your head calc for these valves. If that's a two to 32, we said it was 7.4 feet. I assure you that that, 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 and that is gonna add up to more than 7.4 feet. So yeah, it's not going to automatic flow balance valves are not even though it has a, a spring in it, is not going to require more uh, head loss in your pump calc. Hey John, okay. another question that hey. came up: um, Have uh, any projects maybe you've seen install manual valves originally and then switch to automatic, and did the client see any improvement in the system performance? Uh, we have some jobs out there, mostly, uh, <clears throat> like we said here, so, uh, <laughs> right, retrofitting automatic full balancing valves aren't too many jobs out there, and ones that do occur are usually, uh, we're going to keep, we're going to keep these there on the terminal units, and we're going to make sure that we're going to rebalance the risers. <laughs> Right, because it's a direct return system and we're not getting flow to that last riser. So uh, there are some jobs out there that automatic full balancing valves go on the risers. To, so at least the riser has the right amount of flow. Um, and that allows, you know, if you need 27 GPM uh, here, maybe that doesn't exist, maybe that doesn't exist, but at least you have 27 uh, here uh, and that pump Right, so this spring and this automatic pushes back, so 27 gets to that far riser um, where it did not previously. As far as you know, do they? Our again, our opinion is uh, there's some bad. Uh, I used the example of chilled beams before. There's some bad chilled beam jobs out there. We know of them. Um, again, as the as the uh, as the, as the, the Upanor radiant rep. Uh, sensible cooling jobs, uh, they're all they all work, and part of that is water balancing. Right, we've been through this. Uh, the, the war stories out there. I'm sure you have them as well. Right, condensing boilers with an energy model, <clears throat> everything works very well, and then start the boilers and, and get a call a year later as they uh, as they take a good hard look at it. Well, they didn't save any energy dollars, no gas dollars at all. What happened here? Well, that far wing didn't wasn't hot. So did they balance the system? No, they just turned it up to 180. <laughs> did it work? Yeah, it worked, but you didn't you didn't save any money on gas. You didn't make the boilers condense. So yes, yeah, a product whose uh, whose time has come. Good. Yes, thank you again. So types of flow limiters, again, they're mostly applied at the terminal unit. Don't have to put them on the risers or the runouts. <clears throat> so the product involved or sold most of the time is usually up to two inch. And this is what it would look like. Um, usually comes as a kit, if you will, per terminal unit, um, same valve body, if you will. Um, so we always try to put this I'll blow down now to differentiate the strainer, isolation valve, strainer, blow down union from this device, which is looks like a backward strainer. <clears throat> uh, again, union as our, our, our supply come back out. Here's our, uh, our air vent uh, union, control valve union. Uh, there's our, our, uh, <clears throat> our housing for the, for the cartridge with access 
uh, verification ports, and lastly, an isolation valve, a true isolation valve. Again, this is not to adjust anything. I would say 98% of the flow limiters are in this size because, again, they only go with the terminal. Do we have larger ones? Yeah, we do. We have the 30 inch for campus stuff if that's uh, that, that's part of what you do. Um, but if you have a real large air handler, um, yeah, it would look like this. There's the uh, there's the automatic full balancing valve right there. Same as this, right? Here's our butterfly valve isolation strainer. Uh, T with a there's a three-way valve set up, bypass, and here's our terminal unit. Come back out, uh, air vent. There's our three-way valve, and there is our uh, automatic full balancing valve, verification ports, and lastly, uh, butterfly isolation valve, true isolation valve. So quick question, don't have to answer it, but <clears throat> just a, an idea, right? So here's our, our air handlers. Uh, there's a supply and return. Uh, so our air handler is not shown, but it's there. And it has a pressure drop. So if this air handler, <clears throat> if this control valve went into full bypass, what else would you need in this contraption if it was a manual valve system? What would happen? If this is a manual valve and this three-way went into bypass, full bypass, would the flow increase? Yes, it would, because it doesn't see this pressure drop of the coil any longer. It's got a home run right back. So if this was a manual valve, fixed orifice, right, with the same pressure, it would overflow. And overflow costs somebody money. So if this is a manual balance valve system, you would have to add another manual balancing valve in this bypass to mimic the pressure drop of the coil. So something to think about if you have a whole bunch of three-way valves on your project. <clears throat> Automatic flow balancing valves only require one valve here on a three-way manual. Really, if we do it right, should have another valve in the bypass. Like that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So terminal unit applications, <clears throat> again, they uh, <clears throat> lend themselves to kits, if you will, per terminal unit, right? Because it's it's a flow limiter, and that flow limit, that that flow is, uh, you know, definitely dedicated to this particular terminal unit. So it really should be tagged. This has got to go on that particular terminal unit, air handler 1C, air handler uh, <clears throat> 1H. So again, same as before, here's our supply isolation valve, uh, strainer, blow down, PT port union, uh, <clears throat> terminal unit coming back out. Here's our air vent, a union. Uh, control valve, another union, uh, verification ports, here's our flow limiter, um, and our lastly, before it goes back home, is our isolation valve. So what are the moving parts in this, uh, in this, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, schematic? Well, there's a moving part there, right? It's got a spring, it's a piston, if you will, and of course our control valve is a moving part. So some folks put them in one valve body. There's the same as before, except the union, there's our control valve, and it's the same valve body as the flow limiter. So two moving parts in one valve body. So yes, they do work in harmony. They do not fight each other. These the two, two moving parts are, uh, are, <clears throat> are advantageous to the performance of this terminal unit. How so? Well, let's take a look. This is our valve stem. Here's our flow. This uh, yellow line is our design flow, our design day flow. This is going to be a modulating control valve on a terminal unit. So control valves and flow limiters working together, right? Misconception that they fight each other. Nope, it's a flow limiter. The control valve always has authority. 
So a modulating control valve opening, modulating to temperature in the space, perhaps, <clears throat> valve stem is opening. The cartridge is fully extended. It's not doing anything. It's a fixed orifice. The valve, again, has full authority. But the dynamics of the system, the pressures are all over the place. So the differential pressure across that control valve pushes or tries to uh, put a whole bunch more flow through that control valve than it actually is need, or needs, requires. So before that control valve modulates back down, <clears throat> that pressure tries to overflow that coil. And that's where our flow limiter comes in. That's when the cartridge starts uh, modulating, uh, providing a variable orifice and limiting the flow. So no, they do not fight each other. They, they re work rather well together. Another question uh, for you, John. Um, we might be uh, jumping the gun here with this, uh, but how does this compare to a PIC V or a pressure independent control valve? Uh, well, it's uh, <clears throat> we'll get that last, but uh, you know, to 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 jump it a little bit is that uh, a PIC V is a flow limiter. So we'll talk about what, how that affects uh, everything else in your system. So, you know, excellent product, right? A PIG-V would probably react to, <clears throat> to this differential pressure increasing before the flow limiter has to come into play. But, um, but yeah, PIG-V uh, modulating control valve is also a flow limiter. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, so yes, they work together. And yes, a PIC V is a, yeah, a flow limiter, control valve in one body. <laughs> good, good question. So installation note, since it's a, a spring-loaded device, right, it's a cartridge, <clears throat> these types of valves, automatic flow balancing valves, don't require straight pipe before or after. So it doesn't, you know, in all these new systems, you don't have a whole lot of room underneath the, uh, the cabinetry of, of, uh, of, a, of a convector and much less a low temperature convector. So automatic flow balancing valves do not require straight pipe before or after. More often than not, that control valve is right next to the automatic to the balancing valve. But in this case, if it's an automatic flow balancing valve, it doesn't affect the accuracy of it at all compared to affecting the accuracy of a manual balance valve. All right. So this is what we see out there, right? Is this going to work? I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work. So here's our device right here. Here's our control valve. <clears throat> Elbows turns. There's our manual valve right there. Turns and 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 disappears. So this is realistically not in accordance with an installation manual for this device. So does it work? I don't know. Hope is not a strategy. What could possibly happen? Well, what is this? What is this terminal unit right here? That's a panel radiator. And if I was designing a panel radiator system, it would be really low temperature because this thing's about ankle high right there. And if this is not balanced to do it right, you have to touch that red disc and probably a hundred other red discs to make it work perfectly. If that's what you do, that's great. But if it doesn't, and if this zone doesn't get the temperature, it doesn't keep temperature, Instead of touching all those red discs, you're probably going to turn up the temperature supplied to this device. And that's where it gets kind of dangerous, because that's ankle high. So, yep, balancing is more important than ever on these new systems, because they're going to be warm water or cool water, not hot water. Not chill water, either. Good. All right. So flow emitters and variable speed pumping. So a quick basic system. 
Here's our pump at the bottom of the system. Uh, here's our terminal units. And at the top, we have a three-way valve to keep water moving no matter what. And here's our pressure transducer across the index circuit of our system. There's our balancing valves and our uh, control valves. So let's say, for argument's sake, that these control valves on the second floor up are 50% closed. This bottom first floor terminal unit is wide open. So if these are manual balance valves, what happens? Well, it's a dynamic system, so I'm really not quite sure, but at the very least, we're worried about over pumping this terminal unit. If these are automatic flow balancing valves instead of manual valves, what happens? At the very least, we don't over pump this, right? <clears throat> this pushes back if it wants to over pump, and that differential pressure goes up up the ladder, if you will, and that closes, pressure goes up, closes, closes, pressure goes up till it finds its way across our transducer and it winds the pump down. If we over pump and we're allowed to over pump again, if a fixed orifice, you can get a whole bunch of water through any fixed orifice with enough pressure. We don't get that pressure up to our transducer and we over pump. If it's a flow limiter, you can't over pump it. Okay, good. So pumps with VFDs, right? We put a VFD on everything we possibly can, right? Pump affinity law number three. Have the RPM and the horsepower decreases by eight times. <clears throat> so VFDs on every pump. Most manufacturers are putting VFDs right on the pump, right? They map the the performance points of the pump right into the VFD, right? Because in the uh, in the in the power calc, right, there's flow, head, efficiency, and all that goes in there. And if you put all those points in there, this remembers the power required at all these points. And then you program it for design day and the control head. So <clears throat> here's our pump curve, <clears throat> and we have a system curve, right? The more water we try to put through our system, the more resistance to that flow there is. So here's our design day. I don't know what it is, 750 roughly at 90. There's our design day system curve. Very rarely are we on design day, 2% of the time, let's say, in heating. So our two-way valves, or some of them, are going to close. What does that do to our system curve? Well, it pivots this system curve, this light blue line around zero, zero, zero GPM, zero head, uh, counterclockwise. So as two-way zone valves close, right, that curve moves, pivots clocks, uh, counterclockwise. And how these are, you know, whether you have a transducer out there or a self-sensing, right, <clears throat> the path of this performance point is going to be along the blue line. And the pump can only perform along the, where the blue line and the light blue line intersect. So it's going to look like as, as, as zone valves close, the path of this <clears throat> uh, uh, performance point is going to move downward and to the left. And that design day hertz of 58.7 now is going to wind down to 40 hertz. That's in a perfect world. So if we have any over pumping at all, <clears throat> right, that the first uh, that first floor, second floor, third floor, um, we're over pumping there. What happens to our system curve? Well, it hasn't pivoted clockwise as far as it could have. Maybe it looks like that. And again, we can only perform where the system curve and the pump performance curve intersect. So now we're there. I don't know what hurts that is, but it's higher than 40. Is that a big deal? If you're in the, in the energy efficiency business, it's a very big deal. Not because I say so, right? But because pump affinity law number three says so. Any decrease in RPM is a big deal 
horsepower savings wise. So any VFD on any pump is gonna work better <clears throat> if we don't over pump. The only thing that makes us not over pump on any, through any terminal is an automatic flow balancing valve. Any questions on that? Okay. So, little review. Yes, <clears throat> the end user will save energy dollars. Right? Higher delta T systems, viable options, less problems, less people turning temperatures up or down. The future is going to involve a lot of sensible cooling only systems. Radiant and chilled beams probably are going to uh, be uh, much more uh, <clears throat> considered for for systems, especially the uh, the chilled beam with its uh, <clears throat> with its inherent uh, capability of ventilating the space more so. Other systems work better uh, if they are balanced correctly. Certainly VFDs wind that pump down further as far as it can go. Condensing boilers keep that delta T high, so it can uh, make that return temperature come back low, and condense the boilers. Air to water heat pumps as well. Definitely uses fewer valves. That's kind of lost in the sauce on a lot of projects. Um, if it's designed correctly, manual valves have to be on every every T. No labor cost to balance. It's an automatic flow balancing valve. If you like to verify it, that it's doing its job, yes, you can hook up a meter to it. If you had an, an automatic flow balancing system and you added a new zone, you don't have to touch anything else. You just add that new zone with an automatic flow balancing valve without knocking on office doors saying I have to get to your terminal unit to rebalance the manual valve. And what else? Right? Save labor. All manufacturers of automatic flow balancing valves combine functions into one valve body. So one, two, three, four. Right? This is a four hookup, four connection hookup. And there's our isolation valve, our strainer, our, our union. <clears throat> In its simplest form, this can go right on a, on a terminal unit. There's our union and there's our uh, return. There's our automatic flow balancing valve. If this was all installed separately in the field, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 12 connections, labor being what it is in New York City, not a bad way to go. And again, <clears throat> all things being considered, if you can combine more things uh, into one valve body, um, this is a automatic flow balancing valve, modulating valve, on off valve. If you think automatic flow balancing valves are the right product to make your system perform as you uh, as a as designed or intended, right? What do you have to know? You have to know the flow rate required for the application. You already know that. You already sized your terminal units. You already have the GPM design day flow. That's what you have to know. Pipe size, of course. <clears throat> Working pressure. <clears throat> what kind of pipe connections, threaded sweat and the like, maybe PEX, right? System pump capacity, is it over 75 feet, less than 75 feet so we can get the right uh, pressure control range where the flow limiters are in relation to where the pump is? Hey, do we have to change this in the future? We may go with one type of, uh, of automatic flow balancing valve that does not have access to the cartridge but if it is going to change maybe we uh, we put a we put access in there i want to go from 5 to 8 gpm later on and again most reps do this <clears throat> really just uh, 
um, the terminal unit schedule, which is already what you have to do, send that out and you can get a corresponding automatic flow balancing valve schedule. Right, because manual balancing valves usually are considered a fitting. It's on the shelf somewhere and it's supposedly has to be adjusted in the field. So as long as you know the pipe size, it's kind of a fitting. I would consider automatic flow balancing valves are more of a device. It's one more device, that's true, to put on your plans and uh, and schedule. If you if you if you think automatic flow balancing valves are what you want for your system, you really have to schedule them. Uh, they can make or break that sensible cooling only project. If you think that's a good idea, you really have to schedule them. Details, of course, are always available. And of course, you may have to add a specification or change your specifications um, to make sure, to ensure that um, when the job goes out to bid, that that number goes in, um, in the quote. That's what a schedule will look like, right? Again, this is kind of what you already have for equipment <clears throat> item. And of course, flow rates are already already sized. So yeah, it's not a, not a difficult task, but it is yes, one more schedule to put on your in your plans. But uh, again, if you're <clears throat> if you believe it to uh, to uh, enhance the performance of your system, not a bad idea, right? These devices, since they're multiple functions in the same valve body, uh, they save space. Yeah, they save connections, but they save space also. Uh, get what's on your detail. Oh, I ran out of room. I can't get this in there. I can't get the air vent in there. Now it's now it's airbound and we're, and, and, and we're not making temperature in the zone. Get what's on your detail. So this is the uh, recommended detail by ASHRAE. <clears throat> You know, kind of kind of basic isolation valve strainer with blowdown, PT port union, and there it is right there. Isolation valve strainer blowdown PT port. There's a union, in one valve body. Hard to run out of room. Same on the return side. So some basic rules should you decide to use a. Uh, automatic flow balancing valves, <clears throat> right? Some good rules, right? Manual valves in series with manual balancing valves. Yes, we've seen this before, right? They're on the run out, the riser, <clears throat> and, uh, and of course the terminal unit. So yeah, you could put manual, you should put manual balance valves in series with manual balancing valves. Manual balance valves in series with automatic flow balancing valves. Yes, we can do this, right? We start with the radiant manifold. Right, each loop, if you will, tubing that goes into the floor had a manual balance valve on it. But at least we know uh, what flow is going to the whole entire manifold via an automatic flow balancing valve. Automatic flow balancing valves in parallel with automatic flow balancing valves. That is the basic full automatic flow balancing valve system. Not so good rules. Manual balance valves in parallel with automatic flow balancing valves. Nope, can't do that. One has a spring pushing back. One is a fixed orifice, which you can get any, any flow you want through with enough pressure. So we do not put manual balance valves in parallel with automatic flow balancing valves. So there's a question about retrofit. So really, uh, <clears throat> Again, that retrofits are probably going to be um, <clears throat> manual balance valves in series with automatic. You can't put automatic valves on some terminal units and not others because then they'd be in parallel. And we do not put automatic flow balancing valves in series with automatic flow balancing valves. It doesn't, you only need one flow limiter. Good. So let's talk about that. Where do we see this? What do we see this occur? <clears throat> so manual balance valves in parallel with automatic flow balancing valves. Let's go back to our flow limiters and <clears throat> variable speed pumping. <clears throat> automatic flow balancing valves, here they are. And we said that if this was wide open and these were modulating closed, at least we wouldn't over pump this bottom, this bottom uh, <clears throat> terminal unit. 
And that's usually okay, but sometimes it's not okay. So when this valve starts to modulate closed, that pressure goes here. And there's a certain increase in flow. If it's below the flow limiter cut uh, <clears throat> GPM, the flow, you know, the flow limit, um, if it's 10 and this is eight, and then it goes to nine, the output of this coil changes until this valve modulates back down. And then it occurs here, and then it occurs here until it gets to our pressure transducer, and then this modulates uh, the speed of our pump down. And this can be okay in a lot of different applications, but sometimes it's not okay. This temporary change in output as we go further and further from the pump until it winds down can be an issue in certain applications. So where does this happen and where does it matter? Usually very large systems and it creates a sudden change in performance. And while it doesn't really matter in apartments or hotels. It matters in hospitals, uh, operating rooms and the like. As one operating room shuts down, the other operating rooms students cannot, they can't change temperature even <clears throat> for a short period of time. Research facilities, consistency is, is, is imperative. Temperature, app process applications as well, and even schools, right, where we know that comfort and the like and ventilation for that matter, are just affect test scores, attendance, and teacher health as well. So that's why the pick valve is, is, uh, is what is a modulating valve with an internal flow limiter. So it reacts immediately to that changing uh, pressure differential <clears throat> and doesn't uh, allow that uh, <clears throat> that coil to to put out more or less uh, output than it needs and change the zone temperature, even for uh, a small amount of time. It's that important. So yeah, that's the pick valve. That's what that does. It is a flow limiter. This is what it may look like. Modulating control valve, right? Not on off, modulating control. There's our modulating actuator, our control valve body. And yeah, it looks like just like our flow, our automatic flow balancing valve. <clears throat> There's a, uh, a device in there that limits flow. This is what the chart of a selection chart from a pick valve looks like. There's our size, there's our PSID range, just like an automatic flow balancing valve. And yeah, you have to choose a maximum flow rate, a flow limiter. Good, fabulous piece of equipment for modulating applications. Again, hospitals and the like, not for every application, but for those <clears throat> very uh, dialed in uh, applications where a change in, in zone temperature cannot be, uh, cannot be tolerated. But it is a flow limiter. And the reason why we bring it up is because it's being more and more applied, which is fine. But we have to know that it is a flow limiter. And as we said before, we don't put manual in parallel with flow limiters. So if we did have a pump set that's serving both a pick valve system, right? Here's our, if we did use a hydronic coil for our DOAS unit, we'd probably use a pick valve on that coil. For our fan coils, which is an on off flow on, flow uh, present or not present, we probably use a two way uh, control valve which is fine, but that balancing valve on that fan coil really should be an automatic flow balancing valve. Because if this pump set is serving both, this is a flow limiter and this should be as well. Because you can get any, if this was not a flow limiter, it was a manual, again, a fixed orifice, you can get any flow you want through that with enough pressure behind it, this will push back and you could have some real issues. And that's it.
All right, want to give a huge thanks to John for presenting. Uh, just going to give it to back to Michael um, for any announcements. Just I know we're running low in time a little bit. Am I really? <laughs> no problem, John. No problem. Very, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for presenting. That was great. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, you can put them in the chat, and I'll try and answer them before we end the meeting. Otherwise, um, you can get in contact with John. I think his information was on the first slide. Um, otherwise, I'll show it again at the beginning or at the end of this. Um, so the QR code that's shown on the screen is to get PDH credit. Um, you can scan it. Otherwise, we will be sending out a link at the, uh, sorry, an email uh, at the end of this meeting, and we will, the links will be included in there. Um, a few things that I wanted to mention is that our February meeting will be in person again. Um, that is situation dependent. Um, unfortunately, we had to move this one online at the last minute. Uh, we appreciate everyone who attended and was able to um, ask questions, participate. Um, so hopefully we'll see you again in person in February. Um, and that'll be a really interesting meeting. Greg, if you could go to the QR code for the um, uh, review. So last slide. So the second QR code, um, if you want to scan it, um, you can do a presentation evaluation, um, what you thought, how the meeting went, um, especially our go-to webinar last minute um, presentation. And um, if you are not able to scan it in the time before we end the meeting, uh, please note an email will be going out in an hour and it will include the links to all of these forms. And then also you can find our recording of this presentation on the ASHRAE YouTube page. Link is also in that email um, and you can rewatch this presentation as many times as you want. So thank you all for coming. I'm happy to see you in the new year and we hope to see you at our future events, uh, which will be in person. Thank you.